Hello, my name is Todd jones Ferrand, and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the South Atlantic, Gulf Caribbean, and Mississippi Basin regions. One of my responsibilities is to coordinate development and user support of the Southeast Conservation Blueprint, a primary product of the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy, or CECAS, and I work primarily in the southern end of the Mississippi Flyway region. So today I'm going to give you an overview of CECAS and its primary products and then briefly discuss some challenges and opportunities for integrating plans and actions to attain regional outcomes. So what does CECAS do? It does three primary things for conservation partnerships in the Southeast. It sets a bold vision and an ambitious goal. It helps uh, support pursuit of those goals with spatial data in a blueprint, and it tries to clear barriers for cross-state collaboration. The vision of CECAS is a connected network of lands and waters that support thriving fish and wildlife populations and an improved quality of life for people. So note that dual purpose, it's biodiversity and it's people. This vision recognizes all the values that we hold for Southeast landscapes biodiversity, ecosystem services, recreation, clean water, etc. It also implicitly recognizes that we can't conserve all of the Southeast, but we need to do it in a way that ensures that the places where we do our conservation work for grasslands or other ecosystems are well enough to connected to be sustainable over time. Uh, getting a handle on how well connected our network is now as well as how we are improving that over time is accomplished through the CECAS goal. This goal was developed by the Southeast uh, or by CECAS partnerships points of contacts and approved by the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency directors, as well as the Southeast Natural Resources Leadership Group, which is a coalition of federal agencies with resource management responsibilities. One of the primary products of CECAS is the Conservation Blueprint. This product compiles geospatial data that speaks to the shared values of CECAS partners and helps to clear barriers to cross-jurisdictional collaboration through the application of a common lexicon for describing and evaluating that connected network of lands and waters, uh, as well as providing a common platform for visualizing those shared values across a large region. So who is using the Southeast Blueprint? Uh, we had more than 1,700 people from over 500 different organizations actively participate in developing the Southeast Blueprint so far. Uh, the numbers that you see here on the slide for uses of the Blueprint are a bit out of date. They're from March. As of July 31st, we are now up over 200 people from 91 different organizations as users. The Southeast Blueprint, uh, through these use cases, has helped bring in over $30 million in conservation funding to help protect and restore more than 60,000 acres. Uh, it's important to recognize that the Southeast Blueprint is not a single assessment of uh, values for the whole Southeast region. Rather, it's an amalgamation of sub-regional blueprint products that reflect the values and approaches of partners in those subregions. However, we do use common data sets and tools to represent common values across these subregions as appropriate. For instance, most of these subregions use information on aquatic connectivity produced by the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership, or SARP, uh, which is an initiative of CAFWA and serves as the Fish Habitat Partnership in the Southeast. As we improve the blueprint over time, we expect uh, more unified data and analytical approaches uh, across the CECAS region to be pursued. Now I'm responsible for the middle Southeast, uh, this area in green, including the hatched area in Southern Missouri. And in this part of the blueprint, we really focus our efforts on transparency and ease of use. We want it, uh, be possible for people when they investigate this map 
to clearly understand why the pixel or patch that they're looking at gets the score it does. So we use decision trees to rank four main classes of data, species, landscapes or habitats, uh, partners, and risk. So each pixel score can easily be traced back to its data inputs. We then combine those four uh, data classes in a barcode approach so uh, users can see how their pixel or site ranks out on all four of those inputs. Those barcodes are, are grouped into four action classes that are determined primarily by the species and habitat indices. And these are the things, habitat and, and species are the highest values of our partners. Uh, so for example, an area that ranks real high, both on the landscape and the species is gonna get a, in that fall in that one category, it's gonna be maintain types of actions. Whereas an area that scores low on both would be considered low return on investment. In the current version of the Middle Southeast Blueprint, uh, the species index is based on the distributions of nearly a thousand federal trust species in the Southeast, most of which are also either species of greatest conservation need in state wildlife action plans, or they are on the regional uh, species of greatest conservation need list that was recently developed by the Seattle Wildlife Diversity Committee. Uh, over time, we're working to replace this range data with species distribution models as they become available for each species. The landscape information in the upper right is based on, uh, is based on 15 broad ecosystem types. Uh, the data for which is used to compare existing conditions to desired conditions established for those systems. For example, uh, desired forest conditions for southern yellow pine systems were created by NatureServe and the Fish and Wildlife Service in a cooperative project. Uh, the partners index on the lower left serves to identify leverage opportunities and is composed of spatial priority areas generated from various partners in the southeast including the conservation opportunity areas defined in state wildlife action plans. Uh, and finally, the risk index on the lower right is based on past and expected future trends in urbanization and sea level rise. We hope to add energy development and other land use change drivers in future editions of the blueprint. Uh, so these four indices are combined together into barcodes and those barcodes are ranked according to the action classes. Then we summarize the area of each action class by subgeography in the middle southeast. The darkest blue on this map represents the top 30% of lands in each subgeography. The lighter blue represents the next 20 and the white is the lowest 50% of conservation values. Doesn't mean that there's no conservation value in those white areas, just that it's on the lower end compared to everything else in that subgeography. So how are these products being used? We'll start with a few conservation outcomes from the blueprint. Um, we assume that uses of the blueprint fall into kind of two main categories, outputs and outcomes, and that achievement of those outputs and outcomes uh, lead to attainment of the vision. And so we, attr we track those outputs and outcomes and the ultimate impacts through various methods to know how we are doing. And I'll give you a, a couple of, of uh, examples of the outputs and outcomes, and then we'll talk about the CECAS goal tracking uh, right after that. So here's an example from South Carolina where the state legislature provides significant funds for land conservation with a strong emphasis on improving a quality of life for its state residents. Uh, TNC used the State Wildlife Action Plan as well as the Southeast Blueprint to successfully uh, lobby for reauthorization of the South Carolina Conservation Bank. In particular, the Blueprint helped communicate to the legislature that the conservation community had come together around this set of shared priorities and had a vision for implementing those projects strategically. Uh, and then now the blueprint has become one of the two spatial criteria used by the conservation bank to rank project funding. In another uh, 
project, a blueprint is, is frequently used to support conservation proposals. And in this example, South Carolina TNC approached us for help uh, anchoring their updated vision uh, for South Carolina. And they wanted to focus on large areas within the blueprint, filter out, filter out some of the smaller uh, speckles and hone in on big continuous patches and bring in some other data that wasn't available in the blueprint. This allowed them to highlight a property known as Groton on the South Carolina Georgia border and successfully petition for funding to uh, get an easement on this property. And it's become one of the largest easements in the Southeast and the largest in South Carolina history. The blueprint is frequently used around the Southeast to support the Fish and Wildlife, uh, National Wildlife Refuges is they are required to be part of a landscape conservation design in order to purchase lands, change their acquisition boundaries, and uh, as a precursor for developing other planning products. So we helped uh, several refuges in the, in the Southeast develop landscape conservation designs. And this is a, a shot from a couple of refuges in South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, <clears throat> And local partnerships have rallied around that LCD to uh, develop uh, their own conservation priorities uh, adjacent to those public lands and helping connect those public lands up. Uh, most recently, we've been helping the Waccamaw Task Force identify areas in those yellow in that yellow region there, which has become known as the Waccamaw Gap, and that they're working to close that gap and connect up those lands. Uh, in this last example, we have a couple of ongoing projects here in the Mississippi Flyway where we're working to help state fish and wildlife agencies develop or refine spatial priorities in their wildlife action plans. You can see from this map that Arkansas is one of the last states in the southeast to develop uh, these priority areas. but. Arkansas Game and Fish Commission uh, didn't really think that the blueprint uh, as is was sufficient for what they were trying to do. So as a blueprint user support lead for Arkansas, I worked with them to help step down the blueprint and refine uh, that data based on their own species uh, location. So this essentially brought in higher resolution species data to the blueprint process for ranking landscapes within Arkansas. That led to the development of 19 conservation opportunity areas, which you see in the map on the left. And in addition, we've uh, <clears throat> developed a, uh, a summary for each conservation opportunity area. And I'm giving you a little snapshot here on the right from the Blackland Prairie conservation opportunity area of Southwest Arkansas. In these summaries, we provide information from the blueprint on the composition of habitat, species, and partners in, these, in the COA, as well as taking a look at the mappable threats that are listed in the State Wildlife Action Plan and to what extent each COA um, is suffering from these threats. So this summary kind of gives Arkansas Game and Fish a baseline for developing uh, conservation plans for each one of these COAs. We have uh, now just started a project uh, this summer with Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries to uh, examine their COAs and either refine boundaries or help them prioritize within the existing boundaries. So let's move on from uh, outcomes from the blueprint to outcomes from the goal report. So this is our way of tracking how all these things, all the different actions and the blueprint use cases kind of add up to moving us towards the vision. Uh, and for this, we use a number of uh, different assessments done by groups outside of CECAS as well as inside the CECAS partnership. And you can see that some of our, our ecosystems and indicators are on track for uh, that uh, 
reaching that CECAS goal of a 10% improvement over 10 years. Um, but many are not, especially when it comes to the pine and prairie birds. So uh, we're trying to use that uh, goal report to help spur grassland conservation in the Southeast. One example of that is the Piedmont Prairie Partnership, which is a local subgroup of the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. This group is, has recently shot a video, a general audience video about uh, prairies in the Piedmont ecoregion because it's, there's a general lack of understanding that grasslands were ever there. Uh, and, and most people think it's always been completely forested. But there were a lot of grasslands there and there are still remnant prairies there. And so the Piedmont Prairie Partnership is using that video and the goal report to urge conservation of existing remnants and expansion of those remnants. In another example, uh, I have worked with the East Gulf Coastal Plain Joint Venture to help them step down uh, population objectives for land birds and develop habitat objectives for each state by bird conservation region section of their region. Uh, and so we've, we've, we've stepped that down and used information on the distribution and quality of grasslands in the East Gulf Coastal Plain Joint Venture geography to develop what, are, what the habitat objectives are, what the deficits are, and where we can go to work to uh, reach those goals. Now the uses that I have previewed here would not really be possible if we didn't have folks who were dedicated to providing user support. User support is really important for helping folks understand what's in the blueprint and how to use it, but also for getting feedback on how well it works, how it meets the need, uh, so that we can improve the blueprint over time. So the blueprint is not just a standalone project product, it comes with help. And we have staff across the Southeast uh, that helps support conservation actions like going after funding opportunities and grants and RFPs, developing local conservation plans uh, that develop, that uh, reflect a more detailed and intrinsic priorities in that smaller landscape. Uh, there's also a long suite of services that we can provide at no cost, uh, ranging from creating maps uh, to providing in-depth spatial analyses and write-ups of why your area of interest is considered a priority or not in the blueprint. Uh, and also exploring how large-scale threats like sea level rise, urbanization, uh, and others uh, could impact your area of interest. Most of these use cases are tracked uh, in what we call the CECA story map. And you can see the uh, URL for this site on this slide. And I encourage you to go in and take a look. As I mentioned earlier, over 200 people from 91 different organizations have used the blueprint. And a lot of these uh, use cases uh, you can read about here on the story map. So some challenges and opportunities. Uh, we'll start off with talking about integrating conservation plans. The Southeast Blueprint is primarily based on existing plans. We, we looked to our partners for desired conditions for different habitat systems, uh, stated goals of their wildlife action plans or joint venture plans. Uh, and so it is a it is, in some sense, an amalgamation of, of all those plans, and those plans are, to some extent, integrate, integrated. Uh, but challenges we face are that, especially as you get to smaller, more and more local plans, those plans are difficult to obtain uh, for blueprint of development. Uh, it's hard. We don't really have, while we have staff to support the uh, CECAS and the Southeast Blueprint, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of local organizations and we can't be everywhere all at the same time. Uh, and oftentimes when we get down into these local plans, we find mismatches of scale, data, 
lexicons and, and the values that they're after. And, and so there's a lot of challenges in overcoming this, but these challenges are also opportunities. Uh, it is very important for retaining the species goal to link these local plans to state level and regional plans as well. Uh, and so we try to work with these organizations as we can. An example I gave earlier, the Waccamaw Task Force, we're bringing the, the blueprint in as a decision support tool. You know, it's one piece of the puzzle that helps that local group identify what it is that's going to be uh, most effective within their capacities to achieve the larger conservation goals. And so we're, we're working to develop as many use cases as we can with local groups. And as I said before, that kind of information and, and dealing with those mismatches of scale data and values helps us uh, rethink the stuff that's in the Southeast blueprint so that we can improve that over time. Integrating conservation actions. Uh, the Southeast blueprint is, is primarily designed to support multi-jurisdictional approaches. Uh, it originally started with landscape conservation cooperatives. So you had multiple states coming together around a, a, a specific geography. Uh, and the FWS continues to support those states and trying to help those states work together across their borders. But it also, uh, we, I speak about multi-jurisdictional in terms of within state stuff, getting the Forest Service and NRCS and state wildlife agencies and TNC and all, and all those kinds of groups together on the same page about particular landscapes that they're working in. Uh, we, we focus on uh, collaborative development and updates. Uh, the governance of CECAS is primarily uh, the directors of the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And as I mentioned before, the Southeast Natural Resources Leadership Group also weighs in on that. And they have a, a representative on the directors, uh, the Seattle Directors Board, when it comes to CECAS decisions. Uh, and we have promised the directors annual updates <laughs> to the map and to the goal report. Challenges for integrating conservation actions of all of these partners. Of course, there's the challenge that 95% of the Southeast is privately owned, and so you don't know what a lot of those actors are doing. Uh, but even for the conservation partners, tracking systems and linkages between them uh, tend to be weak or absent. Uh, and so we have a lot of data uh, issues there. Some of our data is very coarse resolution and doesn't have uh, frequent updates, like uh, for the things that we use NLCD for, waiting five to 10 years to get that uh, represents quite a lag when conservation and, and landscape change drivers operate on a much more uh, frequent scale. Uh, we also lack quite a bit of species response information. Uh, many of the species on the Federal Trust Species List or the Regional Species of Greatest Conservation Need List are species for which we don't have a lot of information about. Um, and so making those linkages uh, is quite a challenge. Uh, but there's lots of opportunities for this. We have a, a pretty good track record going now of, of funding initiatives and grant programs and, and, and helping people be successful in competing for those resources to do work in the Southeast. Uh, we've been able to bring fire money to the Southeast when most of it goes to the West. Uh, that's one, one really big feather in our hat. Uh, we also have upcoming spatial technologies. Uh, the use of LIDAR is expanding. Uh, with Google Earth Engine, we can get more real-time uh, analyses of landscape conditions uh, based on satellite imagery. Um, and there's other tools like that coming on board. And as we identify needs from our partners through the Blueprint user support process, we are able to go to USGS and other providers of these technologies and say, hey, this is, this is really what we need. Can you do that for us? Uh, the final opportunity there is scenario modeling tools. And this is something that will 
we're starting to work on now that will give us uh, kind of a proactive look at which kinds of conservation actions are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck, given the uncertainty in future conditions. Uh, so with that, I hope I've given you a, a deeper understanding of CECAS and the blueprint. We are looking forward to the years ahead and working with Southeast Grasslands Initiative and all of you to improve the blueprint for conservation of grasslands and associated species. If you have any questions about what you've seen here or about CECAS and Southeast Blueprint and how it can help you and your conservation efforts in the Mississippi Flyway, please feel free to reach out to me anytime at the email address on the screen. Thank you.